I'll show you and you could see it. Uh, that's the next and the last session. Uh, it will be about the introduction to well preparation operations and also the preparing oil and gas wells. And our speaker is the Mrs. Maria Moswis, has a huge experience. Uh, Mrs. Maria is the production services domain champion at Schulenberger, and uh, she has 21 years of experience in oil and gas with the main experience in wildline and case it all business. Uh, if you will have any questions, please write them to the chat box. I will read them for, uh, try to read them for uh, speaker, and uh, speaker will answer for all them, and just enjoy it. This is Maria, please, you can start right now. Yes, uh, many thanks for the great introduction. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. So today we are going to uh, speak about the topic of perforating oil and gas wells. So this is a brief introduction about perforation and it covers most of the aspects that we, that we have nowadays in, during perforating, especially when we utilize wireline as the method of conveyance. So the first thing that we need to address is the reason why do we perforate? At the end of the day, perforating is going to create the communication between the wellbore and the pay zone. So the reservoir fluids can have a path to flow to the surface. And the idea here is also that we also perforate sometimes to be able to do a successful stimulation jobs. There are perforations that are done to address sand control and uh, the perforations operations are going to be very dependent on the well parameters. Now, perforate, perforating operations are dangerous operations and they require a, a very, very good planning and a careful execution of the perforating job. The main item in a perforating gun that is going to, to be the most important part that will perform the perforation is what we call the shaped charge. So I am showing here in the slides, okay? Uh, there is the shaped charge. There is a schematic of the shaped charge. The shaped charge is composed of several items. We have first the detonating cord. The detonating cord is basically uh, composed of secondary explosive. And this is the item that is going to connect between the detonator, which will initiate the detonation, and the shape charge. We, uh, <clears throat> so here I am highlighting the detonating cord. We have as well the case, the case basically, it is what is going to be containing the explosive in the shape charge. We have here the main explosive that will also be a secondary explosive. You can see that it's in contact with something called a primer. This is also explosive, but this is primary explosive. And then we are going to be having the most important part of the shape charge. This is what we call the conical liner. This is the conical liner. And if we go to this other picture and we can see all the items of the charge separately, we have here the case the liner powder, primer explosive, the main explosive. And this liner powder is what is going to be uh, composing the liner. And as you see, the liner has a conical shape and this conical shape is going to be having an angle, okay? So here is the charge one, is it uh, completely assembled? So if we have a look at history of explosives, if, if our explosive is having a flat end, it, it is going to create just a, a small damage on, a, on, on this wall. Uh, if we don't have a liner, we are going to be creating a cavity, but this cavity is more of rounded shape. But the liner, what the liner is going to do is that it's going to be able to provide to us the conical shape of, of the perforation tunnel, as we can see over here in this picture. Now, perforating is a very, very fast process. We are talking here that we are speaking here in the matter of microseconds. So this is the charge before it, it, it starts the perforation process, before initiation. At two microseconds, 
we have already the explosive detonating. As at six microseconds, in, if you see this part in yellow, this is actually the conical liner. This is the liner, yeah? The conical liner starts being deformed, is going to detonate due to pressure, it collapses, and will form a jet. As you can see over here in yellow, this is the conical liner at 20 microseconds, it already formed a jet. And, and this jet is what is going to penetrate the rock. As you can see, this jet, the tail of the jet, is what is penetrating the rock around 200 to 1,000 microsecond. The tail of the jet finally will deliver the perforation tunnel. And this is basically the perforation tunnel, and, and this is taking shape after 200 to 1,000 microsecond. So we can see here that a very important item for the perforation is, uh, equipment is going to be the shaped charge. There are many kinds of perforating guns. The main kinds that we have are going to be what we call true tubing guns. True tubing guns are guns that can fit whenever the completion is already installed in the well. You can pass these guns through minimum restrictions. For example, if you have a tubing present in the well, a three and a half inch tubing, you might have a minimum restriction in the nipple 2.635, for example. And in that case, you need guns that can pass through the minimum restriction. So the sizes of these guns are going to be also selected depending on the minimum restriction. And the charges are going to be selected to deliver the maximum penetration in the rock. And of course, in some applications, what we will need as well is a certain entrance hole to be able to deliver an area open to flow especially when we are talking about things like a squeeze or uh, applications in which we require big hole charges like sand control. So for the exposed guns, we have two kinds. We will have, for the trotuing guns, sorry, we will have the exposed gun and we will have also casing guns. In the exposed gun, the charges are in contact with the wellbore in the casing guns, the charges are going to be enclosed on a tube. For the casing guns, these guns, we can use them depending on the size. For example, two inch, 1.56, they can go through tubing. Or if the completion is out of the well, we can use bigger sizes. Like for example, if I have a casing that is a seven inch casing, I might need to use a four and a half inch gun. If I have a nine, five, eight inch casing, I might need to use a seven inch gun and so on. So the, the casing guns are also characterized because they are having a high shot density. So for example, in the case of, of some operations with big hole charges for sun control, we might use up to 12 or 18 shots per foot. So in this case, the casing guns will be able to retain the debris, some of the debris that is related to the, perfor the perforating charge itself and the hardware that is enclosed on the casing gun. So how the perforating detonation train goes? So the first thing, I'm going to be having here the detonator. The detonator will contain a primary high explosive. So the detonator is here. The detonator will be con connected to my firing head. This firing head is going to be connected to the unit power in the case of the wireline unit. And what we are going to do is that once we have the gun perfectly on depth after correlation, we are going to send power. This power is going to trigger the detonator. The detonator is connected to the detonating cord and the detonating cord is connected to the shaped charge. So the detonating cord is going to transfer the detonation from the detonator to the shaped charge. We can see over here, this is the shaped charge. And we can see it also how it looks like when it is enclosed inside the gun body. So here is the detonating cord and here is our charges, and uh, this is the gun body, okay? 
For conveyance of guns, there are different methods. We have the wireline E-line method. We can convey the guns utilizing wireline unit cable. Okay. This we can do it either through casing or we can do it through tubing. And there is also another method called tubing convey perforation or TCP, in which the guns are going to be downloaded utilize, utilizing tubing. Okay, we will have over here a firing head, and here are the guns. Uh, typically, tubing convey perforation is going to be used whenever very long intervals need to be perforated in one go. So, in the tubing conver convey perforation, uh, we have over here, as you can see, we will have a packer, we will have a debris uh, or isolation sob, and a firing head. And we will have as well some safety spacer. And here are our guns connected to the tubing. We will also have a radioactive marker saw. And this is going to be important because to be able to, to have the guns on depth, we will have to do something called gamma ray correlation, in which we are going to go with the wireline gamma ray inside the tubing. And we are going to be able to position this radioactive marker on depth according to the gamma ray of the open hole. Uh, so the deployment on tubing or drill pipe, we can also deploy as well on coil tubing. The, another method of deployment of guns will be a slick line. And the deployment can be done either uh, in sections or we can actually use also something called selectivity in which we can actually connect several guns together utilizing switches and then downloading, the, firing every gun in front of the interval of interest. Now, how do we qualify explosives? In the industry, we have American Petroleum Institute. For the qualification of explosives, we have API 19B and we have two sections, section one and section two. In section one, we are going to be having here a block of cement. This block of cement will be 20, 28 day old. We have over here our casing. We have the gun that we are going to test. Okay, as we can see over here in this picture, these are the blocks of cement once the perforation has been carried out because we need to measure the, the length of the perforation tunnel. And in this test, we are going to test a complete gun system. This gun system with this shot density and facing. For example, I might have a gun that is a four and a half inch gun, five shot per foot with a facing of 72 degree. So my concrete target is going to be having 5,000 PSI strength. Okay, this is the concrete target. Okay. And basically, this is going to be used only as a go no go test. In reality, in the wells, we do not perforate cement, we perforate rock. So this is going to be more a qualification to be able to compare charge against another charge from another provider. So in this, we are going to test a minimum of 12 shots, okay? And we are going to be able to quantify what is going to be the penetration and entrance hole for this gun system. I will show you now an API data sheet for a perforating system. We can see over here that you will have the name of the company, what is the gun OD, and what is the, the, the name of the gun, depending on the provider, the charge that was tested. You will have over here as well many remarks. In the remarks, you also have the casing that was perforated, what is the target, the weight of the casing, the grade, and you will have over here the, the shots performance. So over here, we can see that they have tested 13 shots. And in every shot, we are going to be having clearance, casing hole diameter short axis, casing hole diameter long axis, the average casing hole diameter, total depth, the bore height, bore basically this is uh, what we are going to be having some metal uh, coming out from the casing itself after perforating. And we need to measure also the, the, the length of this 
uh, height of this metal. And at the end, we will have an average. And in this average, we can know what is the expected penetration for this gun system and the expected average entrance hole. So I can compare a gun system of one provider with the gun system of another provider. But the same as I mentioned before, in reality, we do not perforate cement. We, we do not perforate a cement uh, brick with 5,000 PSI strength. Uh, the, the penetration of a shape charge is going to be highly dependent on the UCS of the rock, the rock strength. We can see over here a, 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 a graph, sorry. In this graph, we have the depth of penetration in inches. And we have here something called ballistic indica indicator function. The ballistic indica indicator function is going to be combining, basically is going to be combining the UCS and it's also going to be combining the pore pressure confining stress, okay? And here we can see that depending on the rock ballistic indication function, the penetration is going to be more or is going to be less. For example, in the, in the first example in which we have a depth of penetration of 20.8 inch, over here, I have a UCS of 1.6 kPSI, I have a 4 kPSI for, for, for the pressure, uh, com, for pressure, confining for pressure. But if I go to this sandstone, Berea sandstone, with a UCS of A kPSI, you can see that now for this sandstone, the penetration is only 8.5 inch. So as the ballistic indica indicator function is higher, due to a high UCS or and a high uh, pore pressure, my, my dip of penetration is actually going to be reduced. So it's very important to remember the shape charge penetration is highly dependent on the rock strength. This is very important to remember. So then what is actually a API standard 19B, but section two, what do we do? In a Schlumberger, we have got perforating lab, and in the perforating lab, we can actually do another test on the charges. In this case, we will have a stress rock. We have over here our charge. This is the target rock. We will have a vessel in which we are going to be able to have confining pressure. This is a pressure vessel, okay? And this, this, this rock that we test, we actually test several type of rocks, several type of rocks, and we test three rock stress combinations, so with different ballistic indication functions. And we measure the tunnel length that has been obtained under this rock that is actually uh, simulating downhole conditions. Now we have developed penetration model the, based on these experiments. And this is embedded in a software, simulation software that we have called SPAN. This software is also going to take into consideration the casing and fluid, as well as the properties of the rock, properties of the, of the rock that we are going to perforate. So this can give us a more realistic indication of what will be the downhole penetration of a gun system. So we can actually select the right gun system that we need for a particular application. For example, if I have formation damage, high formation damage, something very important is that the perforation tunnel can bypass this formation damage. So I will require to have a deep penetration charge in that case. Okay, so basically this model or this simulation is directly, directly linked to these experiments done in the rock samples. This is just an example of how the penetration report will look like. You will have over here your description of the casing. You have over here the description of the sandstone that you are going to perforate. In this case, this is a sandstone. The UCS of the rock, what is the pore pressure? And you have over here the expected 
you can compare actually several GON systems to select what the most appropriate for your application. And you can see over here the expected penetration downhole. And, and, and it's very different from what you actually get from the API section 19B, section one, in which the test has been done on cement. You can also have over here the expectation of every hole at different facing and the penetration of every bullet, yeah? Now, something that is very critical whenever we do a perforation is that the perforation is a very aggressive event. As you have seen, it happens in a very short period of time and it will develop a very, very high pressure. So whenever we per produce a perforation tunnel, the surrounding part of the perforation tunnel is going to be having a damage. It's going to be damaged. It's going, the, the permeability of the rock about, around the perforation tunnel is going to be decreased. Plus also, we can find as well debris inside the perforation tunnel. It is very important that we can have a method to be able to clean this debris and to clean this damage zone in the perforation tunnel. So what are the factors that will control the efficiency of the flow through a perforation? We will have the phase angle. We will have the damage of the, the perforation damage in the tunnel that we also call crush zone. We will have the diameter of the perforation itself, the size of the crush zone, and the shot density. All these items will be affecting the efficiency, flow efficiency of my perforation. So I'm showing you here an example. In this example, you can see in red, the perforation debris and the crush zone. Over here also, I'm highlighting the formation damage, but I already selected a charge that can bypass the perforation damage. It's very clearly here, my perforation is bypassing the formation damage. And I want to go and clean this perforation debris and this crushed zone. So I have here two examples. The, the, this example here that I'm highlighting with the pointer, this is the perforation tunnel on there. Whenever I have performed the perforation at balance condition, balance condition meaning whenever the well is having the, the wellbore pressure is the same as the formation pressure. You can see here the tunnel, the tunnel is not well defined and we can see only few parts of the tunnel that are open. It's not a very clear defined tunnel. Then I, we have perforated these tunnels with an underbalance, meaning that the wellbore pressure is lower than the formation pressure. In this case, 3000 PSI underbalance. And we can see a very clear defined tunnel. Okay. And the idea is that we remove this crush zone that initially will have a low permeability. And we are able also to remove the debris, as much debris as, as we can from the perforation cavity. So this is an example. This is actually experiment done with cores and injecting some fluids. We can see that over here, the only part, this light blue color is basically the flow okay, through the tunnel. And we can see over here that only this part of the tunnel is effective. This is with a, it is a perforation tunnel that was performed without underbalance. Okay, we have only this part of the perforation tunnel being active to the flow. This is a perforation tunnel performed with underbalance perforation. And we can see over here how a longer length of the tunnel is actually allowing the flow to pass through. Okay, we can see over here clearly highlighted in yellow. The, this, the, the, the tunnel over here is more efficient. Okay. So for the underbalance perforation, you have several methods to perform underbalance perforation. One of them is going to be a static underbalance. 
which is something that is used a lot uh, during TCP during conveyed perforation. You will create underbalance in the wellbore, sometimes by nitrogen lifting. And then you are going to shoot the gun with the underbalance. But of course, whenever you design a job with under, static underbalance, you need to make sure that you are not going to damage, for example, packer in the or any of the items that are present already in your completion or in the tubing. Uh, is also you need to make sure that this underbalance is appropriate in the case that you have a rock that is weak, because you might end up with sanding of your TCP guns. Another method of underbalance is what we call dynamic underbalance. This dynamic underbalance, we will create it by designing a gun that will be able to create a suction effect, sudden suction effect, and remove the crushed zone. So how does this work? We have over here, I'm highlighting here the casing gun. In blue, this blue, these are the charges that are going to open the tunnel in the rock. And over here in yellow, I have these small charges that will only open the carrier to the wellbore. So in this case, what will happen is that I am going to, I will show you here the animation. I am opening the tunnel. This is happening very fast in a matter of microsecond. And at the same time, I'm opening the gun. Now the gun it, at the beginning is at atmospheric pressure. So what is happening here is that by creating this sudden uh, pressure drop, I will be able to uh, remove the crush zone. I will make the crush zone fail by tens tensile failure and be able to remove this crush zone suddenly into the gun. Okay. This is this method uh, is what we call dynamic underbalance. And we can see actually that we in the blue, the blue graph is basically the representation of the pressure, wellboard pressure compared to the time at which the guns have fired. And I have here a pressure drop, sudden pressure drop. And this is what is going to create or what is going to clean the perforation tunnel. So I'm just going to show you again another, the, the, the effect. So I open the chamber. Okay. And I'm just suddenly get the debris inside my carrier. Okay. So basically this sudden shock is what's going to, to, to cause the material that is inside the tunnel to be removed suddenly from the perforation tunnel. I'm going to show you an example of this technique. So over here, I'm showing you a PLT log. This PLT log has been done in two stages. Has been done before we actually apply this underbalance perforation technique. Notice in red color, we have existing perforations in red color over here. And we can see if you look at the PLT, in blue we have the water, in green we have the oil, red we have the gas. And we can see that only few perforations are active. We can see over here that the lower, lowermost perforation, then this one perforation that I'm highlighting here, is contributing to the production. And the upper part of this perforation over here contributing also slightly to the production. And the most bottom one, the two most bottom ones seem to be our contributors of water mainly. Okay. So it was decided to try to clean these perforations that are highlighted in green color, these intervals. And here, this is the intervals that were positioned the dynamic underbalance gone. And then after we shoot this gun and clean these intervals, we can see now how these perforations start contributing to the flow. So this is before doing the underbalance technique. We have over here just this contributing. And this is after performing the cleaning of the perforations by the underbalance technique. These are the treated intervals. And we can see now 
how these uh, intervals that were not producing initially, they started to contribute. So this is a way to be able to clean existing perforations or to open new perforations by applying sudden dynamic underbalance, which will be able to create a more clean perforation tunnel. And we can see here that uh, it's a very effective technique. Now, there is another uh, challenging <clears throat> perforation that will be the perforation in the carbonates. In carbonate, something very important is to be able to clean the perforation tunnel, because at the end of the day in carbonate, many times we have to perform stimulation jobs. We want to have a tunnel that is clean, so whenever we perform our stimulation job, this is going to be very effective, highly effective. So over here we can see the tunnel. We see this is a static underbalance. Again, we can see that the total penetration is here, but the tunnel is clean only until this point. Over here, this is after performing dynamic underbalance technique. We see over here the total penetration, but the longer part of the tunnel is actually clean. So it is uh, advisable before we do the stimulation job to try to get the cleanest tunnel as possible. So this is based on SP paper uh, 105022, if somebody is interested. And in several tests were designed to be able to see what is the most effective method for perforating carbonate. Uh, in the first test, it was just apply static underbalance on the, on, the, on the rock. In this case, this is limestone core. In the second one, dynamic underbalance was perforated using dynamic underbalance. In the third one, uh, the simulation was done with a gas filled borehole. And in the, in the fourth test, it was done, the perforation was done also with dynamic underbalance technique with some acid in the wellbore, okay? And then every core has been CAT scanned and uh, the result shown after acidizing. So we can see over here that the best tunnel, cleaner tunnel and cleaner wormhole was done whenever we had dynamic underbalance. The tunnel has been done under dynamic underbalance technique and we had the presence of acid in the wellbore. So this is a very, very clear, very clean tunnel, very clean wormhole. So over here, our matrix acidizing is highly effective. If we compare with other techniques, like for example, here we have just normal conventional perforation and we have got on a, a static underbalance and you can see that even after acidizing, the tunnel is not very clean, yeah? So this is not very effective uh, perforation and, and wormhole. So now, typically, passing to another subject, typically conveying long guns for long perforating intervals has been done traditionally with tubing conveyed perforation. But nowadays, we can also design a wireline job to be able to convey also long guns. So in this case, what we do is that we will utilize several type of equipments. Instead of a conventional cable, wireline cable, we are going to have a high strength, very high strength cable, and a, a unit also that can handle the weight of this highly strong cable. Also, we will have a special weak points and release mechanisms from the gun in case we get stuck. And we have as well, in case of that we perforate highly deviated wells, we have something called perforating tractors in which we can actually convey the guns into the horizontal section and then be able to shoot the guns without the machine. Also the tractor, yeah? The equipment that we use to convey the guns into the horizontal section. We also have some equipments like shock absorbers that will help us not to damage any of our equipments that go above the gun. For example, if I have a CCL or I have a gamma ray for correlation. 
So uh, also we have to simulate the gun shock and the gun jump whenever we convey these very long guns. This is one job that we did here in Egypt, and we can see this gun is a 278-inch gun. And in this case, the total that we convey, the total length that we convey in this case was 28 meter gun length. So 28 meter gun length is around 80 feet. So we can convey long guns also by utilizing war line. So this is another capability that we have developed with the, with, with the perforation. So this is what I wanted to share for you uh, about an introduction to perforating. Now I want to hear from you your questions. I want to hear your comments. And I want also to hear your experience. So just to close uh, for this uh, uh, job that we did, you know, with, uh, with this uh, uh, per extended reach perforation, I want to show you the type of wells that we can go ahead and perforate. So in this case, we perforated a reservoir that is 100 meter virgin reservoir with a pressure of 7,400 PSI, very high temperature, 320 degree Fahrenheit. It was a job performed through tubing with four and a half inch completion in place. So we conveyed, as I showed in the previous slide, 24 meter of 278 inch casing guns on war line. And at the end of the day, we managed to produce 60 million scaf for this well. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot. And I'm here willing to hear from your questions or your comments, please. Thank you so much, Mrs. Maria, for very well explained presentation and the topic. Uh, friends, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can write them to the chat box, and I will read for uh, Mrs. Maria. Okay, I see a question here, and it's related to the facing of the guns. Okay, so facing will be one of the parameters that, that is going to control the effectiveness of the perforation. Depending on the application, we might need a different type of facing. You will not need the same type of facing if, for example, you are going to do a perforation for frac than if you are going to do a perforation just for a normal reservoir. So the facing will vary depending on the application. Also, if you need to do a high shot density perforation as well, the facing also will change to accommodate for the, for the big amount of, uh, of bullets that you might need to, to use during your perforating gun. But the facing is very important depending on the application that you will actually uh, uh, have. You might have perforation for frac, you might have perforation for sun control. You might have perforation for high shot density to, for a, to open a high area open to flow. So facing again, it will be dependent on the application that you need to have for that perforation. More questions, please. Okay, so this is a very interesting question. And uh, where here, uh, Layul is writing, well is flowing in the moment of shooting, okay? Is it mandatory to close the well, to stabilize the well and avoid shock? So, okay, so to answer to this question, uh, sometimes we actually do uh, do apply some flowing under balance while shooting, but this has to be very well controlled and very, very well planned. Normally, we will have the well shot in condition while we perforate in shot in condition, either with the static under balance or we use one of the guns to apply dynamic under balance technique. But also, it is possible to flow the well at the time of perforating, but to be able to do that, 
we need to understand how, how much it will be the underbalance that will be created whenever we do that. And we will simulate ahead of the perforation, the shock and the gun movement that this can cause to the gun. So if we see that the, 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 the shock and the movement is going to be safe, then we can proceed with that technique. Otherwise, we actually limit ourselves to a under, dynamic underbalance technique or a static underbalance technique also after simulating shock and movement or a certain a flow that will be applied during perforating. But of course, we need to simulate ahead of time what will be the effect of this flowing underbalance or a static underbalance or dynamic underbalance on the gun lift and the gun shock. Otherwise, you don't want to lose actually the, you don't want to end up with a breaking a weak point or damaging a cable and having to fish a live gun. So it requires a lot of planning, but it is doable. Any other question? No more questions? Uh, if there is not any other questions, I guess we can finish here. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your attention. I'm very happy to have presented for you. And I really hope that you benefited from this presentation. So thanks a lot and, uh, and uh, have a nice evening, please. Thank you so much for your time and great explanation. Thank you so much. Have a thanks nice a lot. Time. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Good luck. Thank you.